depending on where in the world you are. That was Jeff Olmsted, who was with our church that we had, Diane Burke and I had a church in New York City uh, back through the entire 90s, uh, and Jeff was our music director. Because you'll be able to find this online. I started doing this Sundays with Monday. It was just kind of there, uh, having different guests on, and it's been a lot of fun. Our special guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Siebert uh, from the Foundation for A Course in Miracles. Uh, we're going to be talking about Ken Wapnick, the man, and his message. Uh, so Jeff Siebert is our guest today. We had Jeff on back in March, and there was an unfortunate thing that happened on our end, and that we didn't have it set for enough people to be admitted beyond 100. Uh, we thought that it was, and it didn't work. So we did right away said, well, let's just do this real again real soon. For the people that didn't get in, we'll invite them to come back. Uh, plus anybody else who wants to come along, plus people who were here before. So Jeff was an associate professor of psychology at the University of Miami and then associate director of Jerry Jampolsky's Center for Attitudinal Healing. In 1992, he joined the staff of the Foundation for A Course in Miracles, which was started by Ken and Gloria Wapnick in 1983. He currently offers weekly classes on Ken's journey through the text of the Course in Miracles and bi-monthly seminars. Please visit the uh, FACIM to find out more about that. Now, let when Jeff comes on here in a minute, uh, he can announce more about what he's doing at the present time as well. We like to begin with this uh, passage from the Course. Uh, I'm going to read it out loud, and you're all muted. I suggest that. Uh, with being muted, that you might want to say it out loud with me. It goes like this. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. So, welcome, Jeff. Oh, thank you, John. It's, it's good to be with you again, and welcome right. to everyone out there who's joining us as well. Good to, good to have everybody with us. Yeah, it's good to see you. And um, I, actually, and one of the things I think we're going to start with today is Jeff's going to talk about the infamous uh, the chart <laughs> from Ken. <laughs> I guess it's not infamous. <laughs> <laughs> the well-known chart from Ken as a starting point, especially this is true for anybody who's uh, more relatively new to the course or to Ken's work in particular. And then I've got a question in particular that I want to ask Jeff, but let's let him start off with uh, the, whatever he wishes to start with. Jeff, go ahead. Okay, well, since you were doing announcements, I thought uh, one announcement yes, I want to make as well is that uh -huh. we actually have uh, sort of a surprise to us too that uh, actually enough here of what has been known over the years as uh, Ken's Croy book uh, that we're actually going to be publishing what was available. It's very much an unfinished manuscript. Uh, it was intended to be two volumes. It started as a volume that Ken was going to be writing on the psychotherapy pamphlet. And he realized as he was writing that to be able to appreciate the depth of what is there in that pamphlet, he needed to provide more background from the course. And since this was in a uh, coming within a psychotherapeutic framework. He felt it was necessary to, to provide more background on Freud and Jung as well, uh, as it, and the project kept growing. And so he envisioned a two-volume set. Uh, we are publishing a two-volume set, but it's not quite uh, what Ken had, in, had intended. But the, uh, uh, Ken has often said that there would be no Course in Miracles w without Freud because of the way he was able to uh, really, he wasn't the first to recognize the unconscious, but he really tracked it down in such a way and showed what, what darkness is there in the unconscious that it really paved the way uh, for then the, the course's whole con uh, discussion of the ego, the whole foundation for the ego thought system. A anyway, the book is, it's, a two, it's still being published as two volumes because there was still so much material there. There's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of excerpts that Ken had taken from both the collected works of Freud and Jung. 
Uh, there were a number of, of early sections that he actually completed, a preface, a prelude, an introduction, or close to complete, I should say. But it, nevertheless, it's, it's very much an unfinished manuscript, but there was such interest in, in uh, what Ken was going to be doing with this that we felt that there were a, a lot of people that would, would really love to, to know just what, what it was as far as he had gotten with it. So that's, we're, we're probably just, you know, very, sometime probably in May, I would guess we're actually going to be able to announce it as available. Yeah. I wanted to let everybody know. It'll be two volumes said it'll also be available through Amazon as well as through the foundation. I might add that Bob Draper told me that he was working on that, helping you guys to get it organized, and they said that there was over a million words to start. I don't know how much you were able to get that cut down a bit, but my gosh, a million words. Uh, Kim is the most amazing man in terms of, what, what 38 books in the course of his life? And yeah. Innumerable CDs and YouTubes, and it's just phenomenal. Just, yeah, in incredibly prolific. And we continue... Uh, there are a lot of recordings, audio recordings of, of workshops, classes, seminars uh, that, that we have, which have not yet been released. And so we have uh, staff that uh, are now have been trained on the whole process of editing and getting, getting, ready, getting it ready for publication, getting it ready. So we're continuing again. We started uh, not quite a year ago to begin to release a number of other programs of Ken's that, uh, from, from over the years, a number of them from, from his the last year of his life in 2013. And we've got one yet coming from then that, uh, from March of 2013 that'll be out later this year. So Great. it's just an, an unbelievable, just how much. Unbelievable. And not only that, but I'm doing some work on a book about Canon. I just, it's phenomenal how many people he was in correspondence with. One lady told me she received 775 letters from Ken. It's like, when did he have time to, and it wasn't just like this one lady. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of them, and he was a regular correspondent, and not by email, I might add, that you had to be important enough to you that you would write a letter, and he would answer by letter. I remember once I had just completed the What is Mysticism book that I was writing, and I gave it to Ken. <clears throat> he was up here uh, giving a lecture, and... Um, <laughs> He took it and he looked at it and he says, would you like me to, to give a, a, some commentary on it? I said, yeah. And he said, about a week? I said, yeah. A week later, there's a three-page single-space analysis. <laughs> when did he work that in? Oh, my God. Any phenomenal. Go ahead. <laughs> one, of the, I mean, one of the things he said, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't speaking about himself per, personally, but it's easy to... to understand that this was what must have been the case for him. He's, he says, when you don't have, when you don't have guilt, when you don't get caught in guilt, you don't have resistance and things just flow and, and you're not in conflict. <laughs> and so uh, I think that's what, what we were you know, witnessing with Ken. He was demonstrating what it means to put this, this profound teaching into practice. Right. He didn't talk about it so <clears throat> much in public, but I remember once he did say, that he had a good ability to focus. And boy, oh boy, talk about focus. <laughs> yes. And remember, he also, I mean, the, his access of everything that he had read is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. The fact that he had to, he read complete works of both Freud and Jung in order to prepare for, to put, produce that book. Yeah, and that was for the, I think it was the second time, at least the second time for both of them. He had done it when he was younger. In fact, yeah, he had read- the, the collective works of Freud or Jung looks like- <laughs> Yeah. Like 20 volumes in one case and yeah. 20, I forget. Sure. But he, he first read uh, Freud's interpretation of dreams when he was in high school. <laughs> high school. He said he was sure, he was sure that he didn't, uh, he didn't get everything that was there, but he still recognized that there was something really pr profound there. And right. always, wow. always reference that, but yeah, er, early on. Uh, you know, I, I've, Ken, Ken has described the course as, uh, being the perfect blend of form and content. Uh, the course talks about f form being, you know, what we see, what we experience per through perception, and content being really what's what's in the mind. Uh, there being either just either the ego or, or the the right mind, the Holy Spirit, the the memory of love, or guilt and attack. Uh, and he said that the course really it's as a form, the form that it's come in, the beautiful poetry, the soaring language, all of it, uh, he says, is an integration of, 
the form and the content. And I, I've been thinking about it, and I think Ken's life <laughs> was really uh, a, a nearly perfect integration of form and content. Right. And I mean, you, you, if you read his autobiographies, uh, they're contained in a symphony of love. It seems clear uh, long before he ever found the course, uh, his life was leading towards that moment when he would find the course and, and become the teacher of it. I mean, there's just so much that makes it apparent that he, he was, he knew at some level a lot and, and everything that he was doing was preparing him for the day when he became became that right. teacher so uh may, maybe time now would be the time you mentioned the chart uh yeah, might okay. be time to go ahead and uh green okay. it just <clears throat> there's just so many things that can uh help uh help us understand i you know for myself personally it's like i when i first began reading the course i knew i was drawn to it uh but there was so much that i just didn't understand and Ken really was the one for me that allowed me to be, begin to understand just what it's what it is saying uh, and it's the, there's a huge amount of resistance that most of us are going to have to what it's saying that we can't even hear. I remember when I first I, I did a one-month retreat at the foundation back in in 1991 uh, and Ken Ken was presenting his chart he was doing classes more than one a week. I mean, there were multiple classes during the month I was there and he was always presenting the chart. And I couldn't, I, initially I had no idea what he was talking about. I just, I didn't know what to hang these concepts onto in my mind, but gradually by by the end of the, of the, the month, I could at least present it. I still was only beginning to, to grasp uh, what it was that the, that this chart was actually, providing us, uh, I like to think of it as a, as a snapshot of the course's whole metaphysical system and where the world came from, where, where we came from, why we find ourselves here. And so at least just briefly, I just want to say a few, few things about the chart, maybe as we're talking about various things, John, uh, we might make reference to it. But essentially, uh, you know, there's that distinction, you have mind, body, spirit, and really the chart does lay these things out kind of in, in, in layers. Now, in, in one level, mind is everything, but capital M mind, you see at the very top in heaven, that's, he doesn't have the word spirit up here, but spirit is also what would be above uh, the purple line in, in heaven. That's, that's our reality as Christ, our true self is the, the one son of God, uh, the father and the son. So that, so that's mine. And then everything that's below that line is actually all illusory. None of, none of it is real. Uh, but this is then where we get into little M mind, uh, split mind you see over on, on the left side, uh, Split mind is part of the illusion because it's, it's the beginning of the belief that we could be separate from our source. And you see on the right side, it says dream of, sep dream of separation. So all of this is illusory. And what we have at that, at that level of split mind are these two alternatives in terms of how we're going to look at uh, the course refers to this this thought of separation as a tiny mad idea. And you see that right in the middle of the, of the chart with the little arrow pointing to that. Uh, and Ken always uh, made note of the fact that that little line that's coming down below the, the, uh, uh, the real mind, the one mind, it doesn't touch that line because none of this really has any effect on reality. Nothing has changed. But the split mind is where we find ourselves. And this is where we are beginning to tell the whole story that the ego tells us. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details of that right now, but basically Ken says there's, there's two uh, alternative explanations for the tiny mad idea. And one of them is the egos. It says this is something very serious. And in fact, it's so serious that it involved an attack on your source. You've actually, you've attacked oneness to be able to be separate from it. Uh, oneness no longer exists. You've attacked love. You've attacked your father. And in fact, you've destroyed, you've destroyed your father. So it's the birth of the idea of death. This is where the, the whole concept of death comes from. 
within the split mind, this is the beginning of perception. There's no, there's no perception in heaven uh, because there's nothing to be perceived. Uh, perception is, is dualistic, uh, as Ken would often say. The Course doesn't use that term, uh, dualistic or duality, but Ken makes it clear that that's, that's what it's describing in terms of the, of the ego thought system. So there's the ego's horrible interpretation of what it is that the separation involves. And then there's the Holy Spirit's, which Ken says the Holy Spirit just smiles gently and says, <laughs> what separation? What, what tiny mad idea? No, nothing has happened. <laughs> uh, so the, so that's, that's the split mind. The third level then that we see at the bottom is really body. So we've got body, little m mind, and spirit. And the world and the body are the result of the fact that, as Ken says, the ego has this strategy to protect itself. Because when, when we're in the mind, we can choose. Oh, and I, how, how could I not have mentioned uh, in the circle right there at, at the top between the ego and the Holy Spirit, that's the decision maker. That's the son of God asleep. And Ken has called that the decision maker. The Course uses that term decision maker once. Uh, but it's really in reference to the body and talking about how uh, in the manual, how the ego wants us to believe that the body is the decision maker, that things like reflexes and insti instincts give the control to the body. But actually, it's the mind that has the power to choose. And th this chart then is laying out what, you know, it's there, it's, it runs through all of, the, all of the course, but nowhere is this whole thing laid out explicitly. And it's like it, Ken's mind, he understood what was there and was able to give us this picture that shows us then uh, where, what our reality is, what it is that we believe uh, when we're identified with the ego, what the correction is for that. And then, as I was starting to say, the final defense then, uh, because that decision maker is just sitting there with this choice between the wrong mind and the right mind, between the ego and the Holy Spirit. And it would be very easy to realize that the ego isn't really giving me anything. The ego says it's, it's a triumph over God. You're, you have an individual self. This is really wonderful. Uh, but then says, uh, but also with that, there's a price. You've attacked your source. This is sin. You're guilty. And look out because while you thought you destroyed God, he's back. <laughs> he's he's out, out for blood. He's going to seize back what you've taken from him. So Ken says, essentially what, what the ego strategy is, is to, is to make us mindless so that we could forget completely about the fact that we are a mind, a split mind that has a choice, that has a decision that it can make between these two different thought systems. And so we just project out into a world of form, of bodies, uh, uh, of a world of, of form, form and substance, and we forget, you see, right above the world is that veil of forgetfulness or denial. And so that makes everything in the split mind unconscious. And so you can see Ken's fascination with Freud, that Freud was beginning to really systematically get in touch with what is in the unconscious mind. In particular, what Freud was good at tracking down was what's in the, in the wrong mind. He didn't know that's what he was doing, but Ken says pretty clearly that's what he was getting in touch with because, I mean, it's just... Uh, the darkness of what is there in, in that mind, as even as Freud was describing it, uh, makes it apparent. Most of us are not in touch with that. Maybe it's, some of it shows up in dreams, or spills in, into our waking experience some of the time. But most of the time, we try to keep that covered. And, and we think that all the choices we have are about things that are happening to us here in the world, completely unaware of the fact that this is nothing but a dream. The, the second part of the dream, if you will, is, is, as the Course puts it and, and Ken has, has emphasized. So now we're, we're essentially mindless, thinking that our choices have to do with what's happening here and what's happening in our relationships, what's happening in our world, what's happening with the pandemic, with our politics, uh, you name it. And that's where our attention is focused. And I didn't mention, but I'll just comment on there's the arrow that goes from the decision maker to the left side of the chart and all the way down, it's labeled projection. That's, of course, Freud was, was one of the ones to talk about projection, but that's, the, the, the course uses it in much uh, 
much more dramatic, if you will, terms in terms of the whole world has come as a result of projecting this thought of separation and conflict that's in the mind into a world of form. And then on the other side of the chart, you see the arrow that goes back up to the mind, to the decision-making mind. And that means that when we recognize the problem isn't in the world, the problem is really the choice that I'm making in my mind. It makes it so simple. The world's very complicated. That's part of its purpose to keep us trapped in it, in it to keep our focus on all of the problems that we seem to be encountering as bodies. And so the course, we, we have a lot of resistance to this because we believe the ego that this is a fearful place and that God is there to attack us, to destroy us. Uh, and so we want to stay out of the mind. So we're afraid to go back there. And then even beneath that is the deeper fear of the love that's there that's represented in the right mind by the Holy Spirit, because in love, there is no separate self. So that, that's the ultimate fear then that the ego has. So the ego's only focus is self-preservation. When we're identified with the ego, that's our concern as well. How do I watch out for number one for myself? So that in a nutshell is how Ken has just laid out. And when you, when you understand this chart and you go back and start reading, you, it becomes clear where so many of the things that Jesus is talking about just fit in here and it, it begins uh, to become clear and clear. I, I use it all the time when I'm doing my uh, seminars uh, and I often add additional terms onto the, onto the chart to fit them in where they would go in terms of this, this snapshot that Ken has laid out for us. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very helpful tool, tool. And it's just one reflection of the, uh, the depth of Ken's understanding of, of this teaching because as I say, G Jesus doesn't lay this out anywhere in a, in a linear, linear fashion, but as you understand what it's saying and you go back and read the material, it becomes clearer and clearer that uh, this, this is what's underneath everything that Jesus is saying. If I think there's a place in the course where it says that the, uh, correct me on this, if I got this wrong, says that the ego suspects that there's something else? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not good at quoting the course either, but it does, it, do, it says it is aware that there is a, a power, uh, and Ken has emphasized this, it's, it's the, really the fear of the, the mind's power to choose against it. Right. So, so but that also means we walk around in this kind of angst of, uh, lacking purpose and lacking meaning and knowing that there must be some purpose or meaning, but the ego can't get, can't get that. No, no, there's, Ken has, Ken has said, basically, we're not trying to, to heal the ego. <laughs> the ego is the ego, and it's, right. it's, it's hatred, uh, it's attack, right. it's conflict. And what we're trying to do, though, is not take it so seriously. That's what gets us into trouble. Ken has said the, the problem is that we took that tiny, mad idea seriously. And that's, we said it was serious. It was attack and we needed a defense against it. And that's why we then end up finding ourselves mindlessly in the world, trying to using whatever power of mind we still seem to have, the little that we still have, and what little bit of consciousness that we still have, uh, focused on trying to solve problems here. Uh, so the, it, Ken would say the ego is, is a 100% uh, thought system of murder, and the Holy Spirit is a 100% thought system of love. And you can't bring the love to the murder. You choose between the two. And the ego itself, we, we talked about this uh, a month ago, the ego itself is not really the problem. The problem is uh, on the chart, there's a little red arrow that comes off the decision maker. And that's the power of our belief. Our, our desire for the ego is the problem. It's, and that's what needs to be undone. The ego doesn't really need to be undone because it's, it's nothing. But our belief in it is what needs to be undone. There's a piece that I wrote this morning for uh, whether I'd send out a little epistle uh -huh. on Sunday morning. It's called Sunday with Monday as well. And in there, I was talking about this concept. And of course, I talk about your other life, your other self or your true self. That's who we really are outside of the, the mask of the ego. But, I mean, that's really ongoing. We, we have this other life. That's, that's who we really are. Yes. And always has been. 
and always will be. Yeah, and and has never right has never changed. Uh, one of the one of the things the chart I think helps us recognize too is that that reality is above the purple line. I mean that's totally right. un, unconscious. That's way beyond anything. That, but but the right mind is the memory of that, uh, the reflection of that, and that's uh, what the course is telling us we can get in touch with. And so Ken has often emphasized uh, we don't jump from believing we're a body to remembering that we're spirit. We have to take the intermediate step of recognizing that we're a, a sleeping mind, a sleeping and dreaming mind that has this choice between the ego and, and the memory of, memory of who we really are. Uh, it's still, uh, it's the thought of perfect love with nothing in it other than that perfect love and, and no awareness of anything outside of itself uh, is terrifying when we're identified with the ego. And so until that's gone, and that, that's what the course calls the real world then is when we no longer have any, any identification with the ego and no longer, there's no guilt in our mind. And so- but Could you talk about- Go ahead, I'm sorry. What, what, the, what the holy instant means in that context, and that would be our memory of this real self? The, yes, the, the holy instant is, it's the decision maker experience is that when it accepts the correction for the ego's interpretation of, of who we are. And so it's a, it's a moment outside of time and space. Time and space are in the world of, of form and bodies. Uh, the, the mind actually, the split mind is, and the decision maker is, it's not eternal, but it's outside of time and space. And, and that's the holy instant. And the, the present, the course also talks about the present or the present moment uh, that isn't caught in, in linear time. So then there has to be this decision to, to accept the, that truth. Yeah. At some juncture. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a process. There's a lot of places where uh, Ken points out that the course is clearly saying that this is a process that we do experience and it's taking time. Not, not that it necessarily would have to. We could in just one instant change our mind totally. But our fear is too great. So that, that's why we experience, experience it as a process. So it does... Seem, seem to take time for, for most of us. So how do you see when people say they have a mystical experience or revelatory experience where they, they get some insight into this, they just, with or without the course, it just could happen to sure. anybody that you, you see whatever you love in all of its manifestations? Or God? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's cert uh, certainly people can have wonderful experiences that re reflect this. Uh, Ken, is, Ken is cautioned, if, if the course is your path, uh, yeah. a lot of people have an experience like that and then that becomes their goal and that's what they're, try they're trying to, to have more and more of. And, and Ken, is, Ken has said on a number of occasions, view it as kind of a signpost along the way that tells you you're heading in the right direction. But the course's process, again, if, if this is a path, the course's process is forgiveness which is really a matter of looking at, uh, we made the world, I, I didn't really emphasize this, but we made the world to project our guilt onto it. And, and so the world then is not something we want to deny, but it becomes, becomes our classroom. This is a, the, the word classroom is used only once in the course in the, in the beginning, but, but Ken picked up on it and uses it as a helpful way to think about uh, our experiences here in the world, uh, our experiences as a, as a body, that it, this is our classroom. And it's our classroom not to learn how to make things work in the world, <laughs> as other spiritual paths might, might teach us, uh, help us do. But, but it really is to recognize where we've projected our guilt, because yeah. that's, that's the only problem. We've put it outside of ourselves so, that, so we can't heal it. But the, the course, I think, also talks about this world being a prison, and we may see it as a prison. So in that class, it's not a classroom. Except yeah. for the teacher of God, then it becomes a classroom. Yes. You see that on the chart, uh, down at the bottom of the chart. On the ego side, it's, uh, Ken has it labeled as a prison, and on the Holy Spirit side. It's, so that's the shift. When, we, when we're, I mean, we continue to be identified with the body, even though the goal over time is to identify more and more with this split mind. Right. That has right. But while we're identified with the body and caught here, it does feel like we're trapped. And it mm -hmm. feels like we're limited by this, by this body. And while we're, while we're still experiencing it that way, uh, what, 
what Ken is saying, what, what the course is saying is that there's a different way of looking at it where I begin to recognize it. This, this is my way out, actually. I'm not trapped here. This is the way that I can actually undo not the world, but my belief, belief in the world and my belief in myself. But we first, before we undo our belief that we're a body, we undo our belief that we're a sinful, guilty body or that, that our brothers and sisters are sinful, guilty bodies. So it's- yeah, I'm saying a lot of folks as they begin to get, well, approaching death, you know, they, they want out. I mean, they, they want to go home. That, that's the most, one of the most common things of, for people that are dying. I want to go home. I want to go home. And Jerry Jampolsky said that, that he wanted to go home, yeah, which is not a surprising thing because that's we want to go back to our eternal reality and let go of this insanity. Yes. Um, however, there's the line in the course that Ken often quotes, there's a risk in thinking death is peace. <laughs> uh, right. And sure. so that's why the course doesn't say a whole lot on reincarnation, multiple lives. But the idea is, this is why, again, identifying with the, with the decision maker, the split mind, uh, if, if we haven't healed all the guilt in our, in our mind, if we haven't let go of it, then, then we're going to we'll have a, you know, review another life. Keep working uh, on it. <laughs> and so, yeah, keep working on it. And, you know, and it. But it's not like whatever we've gained in one lifetime, it's not the, it's not the body or the brain that's learned it. It's, it's the mind that's learned it. So that goes, that continues. And again, it's not even linear in, in the mind. So, okay. but, but it's, but we don't forget those things. And so, so yeah, it may take, I mean, I know some people also say, gee, I, you know, I hope this is my last lifetime. I don't want to come back. Right. And, and uh, Ken has said, you know, if, if we think it's so terrible being here, <laughs> then, then we haven't been using it fully as a classroom and we'll probably come back. Uh, because what we really want to begin to learn more and more is, is that we really are not here. Uh, but this is just the way in which we then be can become an instrument uh, to help others with their healing as well. So we don't feel, we no longer feel trapped. Uh, and, you know, and if we've used it as our classroom and, and graduated, then, then our body just, the Holy Spirit can just... Uh, the love comes through us and we just allow ourselves to be an expression of that. So we're never, we're never in conflict about what to do if our mind is healed. I like that section on when, when it does talk about reincarnation in the manual, there's a very important word there in the very first sentence, which is ultimately, you know, ultimately yeah. there's no reincarnation. That's right. You know, which, which, <laughs> it's well, you, again, it's everything that's below that purple line that, you know, that heaven is above all of it, including the Holy spirit. Uh, even th there are, there's one place uh, where the course does even speak about the Holy Spirit really as, as being an, an illusion. Uh, but it's a very, very helpful illusion. So that's why, uh, and the course, do, uh, the course does sometimes speak about the Holy Spirit as being in, in heaven as well, but, there, but it can't really be there as a, as a separate entity or being any more than we will be as a separate entity or being. These are terms while we think that there are, that the separation is real, these are, Ken says are helpful ways to think about what our reality is, but it, but it goes beyond anything that we could possibly comprehend. There, there is no, there is no consciousness in heaven. Okay, now let's, let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> because, you know, that's one of my favorite uh, yes. topics here, because when, when I first came to the course, I had um, just a couple of years prior to that, written my master's thesis on the works of Pierre de, Pierre de la Deschardin, the famous French Jesuit uh, priest and anthropologist and a lot of other things that he was. And he was placing so much emphasis on the evolution of consciousness and going from one stage to the next stage. And But it's not the same in the court. I mean, it's not, not talking about consciousness in that same way. Well, it... <sighs> It does it. It does at times because in the in the manual, for, well, actually in the clarification of terms, uh, Jesus does talk about consciousness can be trained uh, and reach different levels. So he does he does speak of it that way. I and mean, early in the in the court in the text, he talks about consciousness being the first split that was introduced into the mind after the separation. So and that's the that's the birth of perception where there's a self and another. Uh, but perception then can either be wrong-minded, where it's all colored by guilt and fear, and we need to do something with that, and we try to project it onto other people or other situations and don't see it in ourselves. We don't realize where the fear is really coming from. 
or there's healed perception, uh, true perception, but it's still perception. And so it does involve images and symbols and concepts, uh, but, but there's no guilt associated with them. And so it's just, it's, they become then expressions of love. Uh, we, we use those then as means uh, within the mind to help other minds that still are identified with, with their bodies. Uh, so that would be, but, but again, Ken, Ken often talked about, uh, he liked the, uh, the metaphor of the ladder that the Course uses in a few places and talks about in, in the Song of Prayer, the Ladder of Prayer. Uh, so in a way, the climbing up the ladder back home, he had a uh, wonderful, wonderful audio set on it called, called Climbing the Ladder Home. Uh, and he talks about all the different concepts that the ego has developed that end us end up leaving leaving us feeling like we're bodies in the world who are victimized by the world and by others, and and so there is a process of climbing back up. And in a way, you could say that that is uh, elevating our level of consciousness uh, in in coarse terms, anyway. Uh, Ken and, Gl and Gloria really steered clear of using that term much. He did talk about talks about it some on uh, the unconscious mind, but uh, because, of, because of the way consciousness is spoken of so uh, as a, just simply a good thing in, in so much uh, of new age teachings in particular, I think they had a tendency to, to, to downplay the course's use of that. Uh, it talks about consciousness, it talks about awareness, uh, and, and they often would say that uh, something like Christ consciousness is a term that you do hear in, in other spiritualities. The Course doesn't actually use that term. It does use the term Christ vision, which would be healed, healed perception. Uh, but it, and it does talk, uh, talk about, again, consciousness can be trained. It can be trained until finally it can reach the real world. But, he, but Jesus says the fact that it can be trained tells you that it isn't, that it isn't real <laughs> because it, it has levels and it can change. And there is, there is no change in heaven. All right, so, but there isn't time. But there but isn't time. time. Yeah. time that's why there's yeah. hope. <laughs> there's hope for change. It, yeah, we're, we're not stuck here. That, that's the good news. There's, there's a, uh, the first change that we remember now seems like something terrible. And the ego says, you don't want to change anything anymore. But that's just the defense against changing our mind and, mm -hmm. and choosing the different teacher, choosing the Holy Spirit. Uh, but but this, this kind of awareness just seemed to always be informing whatever it was that uh, Ken was teaching or just in terms of how he was, was dealing with everyone. He, he, uh, he, saw, he saw people who were just, saw minds really, who were just fearful. He didn't, he didn't see guilt. <laughs> he didn't mm -hmm. see attack. He just saw minds that were fearful, that recognizing a, a call, for, call for love. Right. And, uh, I mean, he, and he could be, as, as I know you said before, John, he, he could certainly be very direct, <laughs> very, right. very firm. Uh, I, I remember one time when I was, I came to him with a, a relationship uh, situation I was dealing with. I was just really struggling with somebody I was having a lot of conflict with. And he just, he just very simply said, uh, you know, he isn't part of the equation. <laughs> it's, it took me a long time, I mean, uh, to, oh. to really understand all of what he was saying, but I, but I got enough of what he was saying to realize he was saying whatever, whatever conflict I was experiencing, whatever feelings of struggle I was having, it had nothing to do with Ken. Right. That, One of the remarkable things about Ken is that sometimes he'd be kind of hard on me, but the remarkable part that I never felt as though it wasn't loving. Yes. You know, it was kind of like this wise older brother who knew better. And, you know, it wasn't like I got offended or set back or how do you talk to me that way? It was like, all right, you're trying to get me to take this to a higher level. That's, and I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. So, he, so, I mean, he, he, there were moments, you know, I mean, he could, he could be comforting uh, and just allow us our egos if I was uh, experienced some grief around a uh, friend being sick or whatever, fearful of, of the friend dying. And he could be, he could be very comforting. Uh, and I mean, right. he, he didn't get metaphysical at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, but I always knew, I mean, I also knew that there was always a reminder there that there was, a, that there's always another way of looking at it. And, 
so like that advice that he gave me that, that my friend had nothing to do with it. It was like, you, you yeah. have to take responsibility. Yeah, it's your projection. Yourself for how you're feeling. It has, it, yeah. it, you're blaming the other, you're projecting. And That's the conflict right. isn't coming from the other person. It's coming from my choosing to identify with my ego. That's, that's the teacher of conflict. The conflict in, is, is there in the mind believing that there's this battle between me and God. That's the conflict. And we hide that conflict and put it out into the world. And then we blame, blame other people for the fact that we're struggling and we're, we're unhappy. And that, I mean, that, that's the big challenge that, of course, Ken says, we have to take responsibility for all of our feelings. No one and nothing else outside of us is ever the cause of anything that we're feeling. That's, that's a very challenging teaching. But that's essential in understanding the force. Yes, yes. Absolutely essential. There's nothing outside of you. I like that line a lot. Yeah. From the course. And that you, of course, is the decision-making mind. It's not the body in the world. Right. And that's why Ken has also said we, you know, we have to read the course from the perspective of the mind and not the body, or, or we'll get just get completely lost. Right. Uh, I think that's why people in the beginning have difficulty. Yes. Because they, it's just because they're still making that association with the body and personality space. Yeah. Time. Yeah, we, we think Jesus is talking to this figure in the dream. We think that, that, that he's trying to help this figure in the dream. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things Ken, Ken always emphasized is that uh, you don't want to bring Jesus into the dream. He said, I mean, I don't think there was a program that he gave where he didn't somehow bring up that point because that's our great temptation is to try to get Jesus to help us solve problems here uh, when that's not the solution to the problem. Even, even in the, the early chapters of the course, Helen seemed to be asking uh, Jesus to take her fear away. And, and Jesus was telling her, you know, I, I can't do that. That would be uh, trying to usurp the power of your mind. You are the one that's responsible for the fear. And, and it always comes from a decision to be separate. That's, that's the problem. And so, it, you know, we, when we, we hear this and we understand it and, and our understanding of it, I think that this is kind of the, in terms of our shifts in consciousness, in terms of what that means to us and how we take that in. And it changes over time as we have more and more experiences. And we just get this at a deeper and deeper level, what it is and uh, who I am within the split mind before I, you know, we, the goal is not to get back to spirit. That, that's who we are. We have to undo everything that's getting in the way of it. And, and that's all of these, these thoughts that we're, and beliefs that we're holding in, in, in the split mind. That's your other life or your identity. Yes, yes. Yeah. Our true, our true self. Our true, true self. Yeah. That we're getting back, which always is and is is right now, at, at this very moment. Even at this, yeah. Even at this moment. Uh, right. Even though we may not see that at all, because then we're caught up in our personal problems and we think that's reality. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, we don't, we won't ever see it. <laughs> Getting back to what you were, you know, asking about consciousness, we, we won't ever see it. Uh, we can see its reflection while we're still in the realm of perception, while we still have consciousness. Uh, but it, the Course says, you know, essentially, we fell asleep and became conscious. <laughs> 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 Which is, you know, we, and so when we wake up, we lose consciousness, <laughs> but, but not as it's not a negative thing for, you know, so identified as we are with consciousness, we think that's a loss, but, but so we may never see it. That would be object, uh, subject object to see it. Exactly. exactly but, yeah. but we do have the opportunity to be it because we already are. Yeah. And yeah, but we, you know, we can be a reflection of it while we're still in the in the yeah. mind, and that that's the, that's the real world. That's the the completely healed mind, uh, just Christ vision uh, constantly, without without conflict, without ever taking anything in the world seriously, uh, right. because we're not taking the ego seriously. Uh, I think there's a line, and it's on page seventy, where it says, "Being is a state in which the mind is in communication with all that there is." Being, being, yes. And, and and sometimes that's, when God is referred to in the Christ, God is referred to as I think it's even a second like presence, just presence, just, just yeah, presence, pure awareness, yeah, pure awareness, uh, but not an awareness of anything other than self, love. 
yeah. God, God, God is, and then we cease to speak because <laughs> there's that's, nothing more to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ken has often said, you know, that's, that's, the, that's what's true. That's a, what, what he would call a level one statement. That's true. But he says that that's not helpful to us <laughs> because we, we don't know that. We, we believe something completely different from that. So that's why the course has so very, very many words because those words are being used to undo all of the things that we believe and that we are still holding in our consciousness. See, what, when we let go of everything in our consciousness, there's nothing any, any more there to be perceived. And that's then when we're back as our true self. Uh, because we, we began with the first concept of a, of a separate self. That was, that was that first, in terms of a climbing the ladder home, that was that first concept, Ken says, that, that really emerged when we, we uh, perceived ourselves as a separate self and separate from God. And that's consciousness. So that, and then we have all kinds of concepts, images, sounds, and all that uh, we then have made up to make up our worlds and, and uh, deal with. And little by little, we, we withdraw the guilt that we're projecting onto all of those different images. That's the real world. And then, and then when they no, long, they no longer serve any purpose, we don't need them. And so that's when they finally, I mean, then everything that's below that purple line that could possibly be perceived, right-minded or wrong-mindedly disappears. And that's, that's when we're back where we never left where we still are. Um, right. We never left. Right. We never left. But it's but it's fearful while we're still identified with a separate self, while we're still identified with an ego. Right. And that's why Ken says this, it, if we don't experience this as a gentle process, the ego is, has joined us in the process and is trying to convince us that we're being called upon to sacrifice, to give up something, that we're going to lose something that's really important to us. So, the course is not trying to take anything away from us that we still value. It's trying to recognize, help us recognize it has a cost. That's all. Right. And we may not want it then if, if we realize, but if we give it up prematurely because we think the course is asking us to, uh, then we're going to feel like we're sacrificing something and we still think it has value. And so it's still very real to us. So that, that's what helps make the course itself a very gentle, gentle path and, and very different from so many others, certainly very different from, traditional Christianity. Oh, yeah. So there's nothing we can sacrifice. It's just, except an illusion. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, and that's, what do you lose when you lose an illusion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're losing nothing. <laughs> You're losing absolutely nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and consciousness is, in, is included in that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole idea of the separate self. Exactly. Boss. Yeah. All right. You know, we're really almost at five till. And so what we're going to do now, everyone, is uh, we're going to take a little break, about a 10 minute break. And uh, there will be some music playing in the background. Actually, you've got a couple of options. One, if you don't want to break, uh, what you might like to do is just sit and chant along with this chant that you're going to hear. This is back to Jeff Olmsted again. This is I am not a body, I am free. Very, very basic, one of the most important concepts in the course that we uh, really try to get that into our, our system and understand it. And then we're gonna come back and when we come back, we're gonna open the room for dialogue with Jeff and uh, Bud is gonna be looking at some of the questions and things that have been accumulated in the chat room. And he's gonna like maybe summarize some of those and offer to us at first. And then after that, uh, if you would like to personally come on screen and ask um, a question of Jeff, you can just raise your hand and our bud will help you to, to find, uh, kind of get in line to direct questions to Jeff. So we're gonna be dialoguing after that. I am not a body, I am free, for I am still as God created me I am not a body I am free For I am still As God created me Great, thank you. Me. All right, so welcome back everyone. So we now have uh, an hour in which uh, you can dialogue with Jeff and or myself. 
uh, probably Jeff, he's our guest. Uh, first of all, Bud, what did you see in the process of looking at the, uh, some of the dialogue They're in the chat room? Yeah, we've got some really good questions here. So the first one is, um, Jeff, what is the name of the new book about Freud and Young? <laughs> yes, you know, I was going to say, when we come back after break, I realized I forgot. <laughs> to get <in> the title. <laughs> so yes, it's the main thing. It's, it's a long title. The main thing probably you want to know if you want, we're wanting to, to look for it is Touching the Heart of God. This was Touching the Heart of God. The title of Ken and David, Touching the Heart of God. Uh, psychoanal psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and a course in miracles, an unfinished manuscript. And oh, wow. then there are two two volumes. And volume one, uh, because they they can't on Amazon be bought separately. Volume one, into the depths from light to darkness. And that's going to be uh, that one in particular. Uh, what Ken had to say about Freud, and then volume two out of the depths from darkness to light. And without going into too much detail about it, Young is included in there, what Ken had to say, and also what Ken had written about A Course in Miracles. And then there's the preface to what was going to be the second volume. So those, those are the, the two separate volumes. Uh, Ken felt that Young got caught up in, he, he didn't remember, or he, he did not re recognize who God truly is. And he got caught up in, in the split mind and things that are in the ego relating e wrong mind and right mind and ended up from Ken's perspective really uh, confusing the whole situation when if he and Freud had really been able to jo join together uh, they could have Ken said of course the miracles may not have even been necessary. What else bud? So Jeff when is weeding your garden going to come out? That one I'm pleased to say that was the one from March of, of uh, 2013. Uh, it's a five-day program, and that one has is is in the works now. It's probably going to be sometime uh, in the summer, or early fall. I can't remember the exact date date on that one. There's another release, I believe, that's coming before that one, and I, I think that's the next one. So that one's getting very close. Is that going to be online or? Uh, it, it, we always announce them. We send out emails. Uh, Whenever I mean, is the course going to be, is the program going to be offered online, like via Zoom or? Oh, or is it going to be, be, stre be streaming? We offer it all, all the formats. It'll be available as an audio CD, available as a, a download, an MP3 download, and then also available from our, our streaming website. We do that with everything. Whenever they're released, they're, they're available in all of those formats. Excellent. And then while we're talking about the foundation, um, are you guys going to be reopening for classes and seminars anytime soon? Uh, we we haven't had a conversation about it, but we uh, I'm I'm expecting sometime sometime later this year. You know, we're just going to have to see how how th things let up. We uh, we do and we do intend to to get our weekly classes going again in, in the seminars as well with with live participation. It's been since the middle of March last year. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that timeline. Uh, yes. But we do hope, hope you know, sometime middle to later in the year. Not, not sure. Uh, take our cues from what, what the CDC and others are saying. Well, and 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 as John mentioned earlier, he's going to be live in October. So, you know, there's hope for Q4. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so how week. how is Gloria doing, Jeff? Any update on Gloria? Uh, Gloria's. Gloria's just been uh, pr pretty stable. No, you know, no, no issues or concerns, and she's she's involved through through Dave in particular. Dave, her son, who is really I I describe him. He doesn't have an official title like this, but I consider him our administrative director because he handles all of the administrative things. Uh, and so he he and Gloria are in in communication regularly about what's going on. Excellent, excellent. And um, so there was a, a, a lot of dialogue about if someone was relatively new to the course, what would both of you suggest as the place to start? People threw out clarification of terms, uh, the manual, the workbook, the text, 
right? Um, and there was an offer of one of Ken's book, uh, a talk given on A Course in Miracles and Introduction. So if you guys could just kind of share what you would recommend for, for, for the beginner mind. Well, I, I would say, yeah, something like Ken's, Ken's little book, in, in Introduction to A Course, a talk given on A Course in Miracles and Introduction is a wonderful uh overview of all of the basic basic concepts and how it came about. There's also an, an audio that's uh, called uh, an overview of A Course in Miracles. It's a, I think it's a single disc set. Uh, Ken gets into the metaphysics more there. And there's also a, a uh, video that's called an introduction to A Course in Miracles. So th depending on what's your preferred modality for getting information, any one of those could be helpful. Uh, in terms of where to begin in the course itself, that's that's really up to the individual. I think whatever you feel drawn to, some people do say that they find the manual in its question and answer format easier to, to begin with. Uh, some people just want to get into the workbook lessons and do that. Uh, I, I myself started doing, I, I read the text and, and did the workbook simultaneously. I'd read a section and, uh, and do a workbook workbook lesson. That's how I work my way through it. But it's, but there's no right way to do it. I, I think each person, it's really, it's really between you and your, your inner teacher in terms of what's going to be mo most helpful for you, what you feel drawn to. I usually tell people to do both. I mean, to, to start the text and the workbook as well. Uh -huh. You can always throw the manual for teachers. It's really great as well for clarification of terms in particular. Yeah. Although Ken has said, if you don't already know the metaphysics of the course, the clarification of terms isn't going to help you understand it. But I, it's still not. It, you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere, and at least gives you an idea of what, the, what a lot of the basic concepts are. When I started studying the course, I, as a good student, just started at the beginning, opened the book, and started reading. And once I was getting into the fifty miracle principles. I felt like I was having a conversation or listening to a conversation that I didn't understand who the other people were talking about, right? It was really an interesting experience. I joined a study group and that helped a lot. And then we walked through, you know, the whole year of doing the workbook. And then, as you said, I read the text while just studying one lesson. I had to resist reading ahead, read one lesson a day. And, and did the work. And um, yeah, that was, a, that was a great experience for me. But I like that you follow your inner guidance. There's so much power there. Um, it, it, uh, next question, and then we've got a couple of other bigger questions and we'll invite some of the folks to join in here. Um, do you have a link to your courses that you teach online, Jeff? Is there an FACIM link that you could share? Or you know, where uh, they can go. The okay. The the uh, seminars that we offer every other month right now are are live streamed. We we're we're a little behind the times in terms of doing Zoom like things, but we're le we're learning. Uh, Bud, thank you for your <laughs> giving us a little further training uh, just in the past week. But we so we do, we'll probably be doing more things uh, online in, in the future. But right now, the only thing that we have in in place, uh, and you can sign up for it at our, uh, at thefasten.org under programs, uh, the, the seminars. And the th it's not interactive like we can have with, with things like Zoom, uh, but we do people submit uh, during the, the program. They can uh, send emails with questions, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the, the weekly class, is, it's just right now being recorded uh, every week. And then we, we uh, put it on our streaming website. And uh, the easiest way to get to that is from the, uh, if you go into the, the programs uh, on the, on, from fasm.org, you can get to, get to the streaming website from, from there. That's one of the options I believe you can take to get to that. And then it's on our class, the weekly classes are under podcasts, they're recorded, but the weekly classes are free. I noticed during the break that some people were asking about this being available. And yes, everyone who signed up for this dialogue today can will get a copy a little bit down the road after a little bit of editing. Sure. Yeah, it's all posted up on John's YouTube video site. And John, would you like to manage the raised hands? Well, I guess I, I, I 
Gabrielli, to shall we start there and then Nancy and, and uh, uh, Kathy? Whatever you'd Gabrielli like. Available. So, um, Kathy, you have a question. Would you like you to go off? ahead? Why don't you start then, Kathy? Yeah, well, I actually wanted to uh, uh, first make a comment to Jeff. I don't really have a question. I just have some things I wanted to share about the time uh, that I met Ken in Atlanta at the 2007 week-long academy class. I was there. Uh, a good friend knew him well, and I'm sure, John, you know Lucia Espinoza. Mm -hmm. She uh, was okay. going to introduce me to Ken. And as we got closer and closer to him, I could just feel this force field of love around him. It was quite physically palpable. And so it was just amazing to me. And then when he sh she introduced me and he shook my hand and looked me straight in the eye and he said, oh, yeah, I remember you. And, you know, I'd never met him before. And so anyway... <laughs> And then another comment to Jeff, you personally, I think that I've been talking on the phone with you for many, many years since way back in the early 90s, yes. ordering in the bookstore when I ordered CDs and cassettes back then. <laughs> and I can remember when y'all were going to move out to Temecula and I was so sad y'all were just leaving the East Coast, even though I had never been up to Roscoe. And, and you said, oh, yeah, I'm going to. So I and then. When I had to call, uh, maybe last year, I was actually looking for the uh, CD set of the Atlanta 2007, but I couldn't remember that it was Atlanta 2007. So you helped me then, and there was your, your sweet voice again. And I said, uh -huh. oh, you're still there. It's so good to talk to you. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to share that. Uh, thank you so much. And today has been wonderful. Thanks, Kathy. Thank go you, to Randy now. Hmm? Oh, thanks so much. I'll be really, really brief. Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment too, instead of a question. Um, you know, I, I remember in um, in one of the tributes uh, to Ken in Symphony of Love, and it actually might have even been yours, Jeff. But um, but the tribute said, and I, I love the way it was put, that there was no gap between Ken and the course. There was no compromising of the course's metaphysics on part on his part. There was no compromising in the distinction between content and form. And I guess I just wanted to say, I think the same thing can, can be said about you, Jeff. I, I've listened to your, your seminars. I, I listened to your weekly podcast on um, Ken's book, Journey Through the Text, which I highly recommend anybody who hasn't listened to it. And, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for keeping Ken's teachings of the course um, alive through your teachings. And that's really all I have. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. I'm, I'm grateful to have had a, a wonderful teacher. All right. So, uh, Ronald, next? No, actually, I think Gabrielle had her hand up, and oh, then okay. I think she dropped off and then oh, came okay. back in. So I'm not sure what was going on, but I do have another question that came up. So, okay. um, in Journey Through the Workbook, Ken cautions about using lessons as affirmation. Uh, can, you know, can you comment on that, please, Jeff? Uh, yes, yeah, so and one of the things Ken has said is we can use them as reminders. Uh, all of the workbook really is its purpose is to help us remember that we, we are a mind that has a choice. And the way the ego can try to join the process is to take the form and elevate the form above the content so that uh, what we end up doing uh, from the course's perspective, it doesn't always have to be this way, but so much of the time affirmations are ways in which, as Ken would put it, we try to shout down the ego. So we're resisting the ego and what we don't realize what we're doing is we're resisting the ego with the ego. And so that's just actually strengthening the ego. So that's why Ken would say, say the workbook lessons are not to be used. The, the purpose is not to be used as affirmations, uh, but reminders of the choice that we have, that we always have between which teacher we're going to listen to. I like that, Jeff, resisting the ego with the ego. The ego's clever. <laughs> anything, anything for conflict. <laughs> 
Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Carol, I believe that you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Who? Jenna? Carol? Carol Johansson? I don't know. Carol Johansson? Yes. Who? Carol Johansson. No. Uh, okay. Can I ask a question? I don't know uh, how to put up, I don't know how to put up a hand. Oh. I just can somebody talk again about reincarnation? Sure. Sure. Uh, John, as you were saying, you know the course the course does in the manual talks about reincarnation, and Ken has even said uh, there are passages that speak of uh, through through our forgiveness practice of forgiveness we can save save a thousand years, obviously that can't be a single lifetime. So the course does acknowledge that th there is something within the dream though. This is all, of course, we're talking about things that would be uh, below, below the purple line. And the way Ken has, Ken has talked about it, uh, he says it's like the, the decision maker has a library of all different kinds of, he used to, originally he called them videotapes, then he called them DVDs, and now we probably can call them M MP4s for streaming, but we've got all of these different lives that we could, they all exist at one, at one time, they're all there, there's nothing, there's nothing new uh, within, within the ego thought system, but we make a choice as a decision-making mind to review a particular lifetime, and there are always two reasons for any lifetime, and it's true for any event that we experience within a lifetime as well, but there's always two different purposes or reasons that we may choose to experience it, and, and we can switch between the two at, at any moment. But there's the, there's the ego's purpose to prove that we are a body and a victim, that we are somehow the victim of circumstances outside of ourselves, and so just that the whole purpose is to see the guilt outside of ourselves. And so that's, that it, <laughs> briefly would be the ego's purpose for all of our lives is to just reinforce that over and over again. That it's, it's not my fault as, as Ken often would say, it's not my fault. Uh, but there's another purpose as well. And that is that we then use it, as we were talking about earlier, as a classroom where we begin to recognize that my, difficult relationships, even my good relationships where I'm happy with what I'm getting from the other person. All of those nevertheless involve projections of guilt. If I think that the way I'm feeling is a result of someone or something outside of me, whether I'm feeling good or I'm feeling bad, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. That's the classroom is, is to recognize more and more of the time that that's not the cause of my feeling. And then I can go back, go back and make a different choice of teachers and begin to recognize even the, even the love relationships. Uh, if I'm really dependent on the other one, what I'm doing is reinforcing the belief that something's missing in me. The right-minded, the holy relationship is where I recognize in the relationship that we're, that we both are sharing something together that, that one doesn't have and the other one is missing. It's something that we both we both have, and we're just sharing it uh, in in this lifetime together. And so, so reincarnation again is just simply a, about the ego's purpose for it is to keep us mindless, to keep us believing that all of our pain is coming from what's happening in our lives here in the world, uh, and not realizing that the pain is coming from this decision to see ourselves as as separate from love. One of the problems with the reincarnation, it's a time-bound concept. And eventually we're, you know, of course, it's times of a vast illusion. So yeah, we're looking to transcend time into eternity. Yes, yes. Yeah. And yeah, and the ego would want to, want to use it, yes, to keep us locked in time, tra trapped in time. Right. And that happiness is off in the future. Right. Rather than something that is available right now in the holy instant and in, in the present, yes. So let's go to, uh, we got Karen Herbert, then Diane Burke, and then Gabrielle. So, Karen? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm with Karen here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm McAllison. Uh, I have a question for, um, for Jeffrey. I'm just curious as to 
how you came to A Course in Miracles and ultimately met Ken. Uh, it, briefly, I was, uh, I, through people I worked with, I was at the University of Miami on the faculty there and, and, and several different people that I, uh, that I worked with, colleagues of mine, uh, told me about the course. I had uh, recently been divorced. It was, I was in a lot of pain and I had an awareness that uh, I was on a, an, I was having an opportunity now to open myself up to <laughs> my spiritual uh, self. And, and as I say, the course came fairly, fairly early through, through people who I was working with. And I borrowed a copy from a friend uh, and colleague uh, over Christmas one time and just felt so drawn when I opened the book and started reading, I, I had a, I had difficulty uh, understanding much of what it was saying, but I could just feel this loving non-judgmental presence. Uh, I was very fortunate within a short time of getting the course, somebody told me about a group that was meeting and I met somebody in that group. Uh, it was the only time either of us ever went to that group. He told me out of, about a group that was meeting close, closer to where we both turned out lived. Uh, and through that group, the teacher uh, was really drawing on, on Ken as, as the uh, source for her understanding of what, the, what the, uh, the course was saying and guiding her in her teaching. And I, it was through there I learned about the foundation opening up in, in Roscoe uh, back in, what would that have been, 1990, 1986, I think it was. But, uh, but I just felt a real draw. I was fortunate this friend shared teachings of Ken's uh, audio tapes. I believe it was the special relationships that he shared, shared those with me. And uh, I just, I realized in listening to Ken, he was helping me understand what I was not understanding when I tried to look at it by myself. So I, I, I just knew that I was drawn to his teaching and had a feeling that I would get involved somehow with him, not, not sure what that, what that might mean. Thank you. Diane, good to see you. Hi. Hi, good to see you Hi. too, John. It's been a long time. It has. Uh, and Jeff, thank you so much. This is so nourishing. What I wanted to ask you to talk about a little bit is for me, part of the real gift of Ken's teaching and, and his brilliance is that while he insisted that you understand the metaphysics as the underpinning and ground for everything in the course, he was also so exquisite at talking about how to practice the course within our experience of the dream. And I've just finished rereading his little two book, two volumes set on kindness and in which he talks about um, the very uh, sad temptation on the part of many course students to use the metaphysics and the course to hit other course students over the head um, rather, than, rather than expressing love and genuine human kindness and healing. Uh, in our relationships with each other. And for me, that, that was some of the most helpful of Ken's teachings was how to actually apply, apply the course in a practical day-to-day -day way and not use the metaphysics to bypass doing yeah. the work of the course. Yes, yes. Uh, as egos, we're good at taking something like the metaphysics and using it to evaluate and judge everybody else, <laughs> but also ourselves. I mean, we people often it's often common that students will use it against against themselves, and that's that certainly isn't isn't uh, Jesus or or Ken's purpose with how we put put it into practice. And Ken realized pretty early on that uh, that whole idea of be kind uh, it, it was something that that people students in particular seem to need needed to be reminded of because uh, we didn't recognize how our egos were. We thought we were doing the course because we got the form right and we weren't getting the content, content right at all. But be kind was Ken's reminder that this is a course in content, not in form. And yet the metaphysics is form and it helps you understand what forgiveness is about. But if we're not being kind, 
then we're definitely not practicing the course, not as it was intended. And, and that's, that's not helpful to ourselves or, or to anyone else. So, you know, Ken, Ken will all, 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 the, stu all the students uh, and, and in his teaching, uh, while he could be very direct and very firm and very uncompromising when he was teaching the, the metaphysics and what it was saying, when he was responding to students, there was just, there was a, a gentleness, a kindness, and a humor too so often he just he had a way of, of using humor and, and so often you do catch that get that in in many of the recordings uh do do capture that it's, it was such an important part of his way of, of of being gentle and kind and he could say some things uh that didn't sound very kind if you just read read the words but the way he said it it was being said with such love that that students could hear it uh, and even if they couldn't in the moment they they knew they they knew that that was their defense because they didn't want didn't want to hear it. So he he uh, that but that that theme of being kind. He often would would say that he would do some programs from time to time, like be be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle is is one and the kindness of healing. There's a number of audio audio programs like that in addition to the to the books that you've mentioned. Uh, he, it was he realized. He had to make people aware that the content is what's most important. Uh, he, he also did caution <clears throat> that most of the time, our assumptions of what it means to be kind can often be misguided uh, if, because we think we know what other people need. And so the other piece of that that he would remind people of is, is that we have to get in touch with our unkind thoughts and step back from those so that the kindness that's, that's there behind that can cut, can come through us that we aren't the source of. Sometimes I say one of the beginning principle, we could say just the Hippocratic go, do no harm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start with do no harm. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Go on beyond that to what deeper time is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. Thank Gabrielle, you. next. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I've started the course lessons in the past years several times and the last time, and I always start at the beginning and the last time I was convinced that I would, um, like this time I'm flying high with these lessons. I feel the healing. I feel, I feel the shift. I'm like, no way will I ever stop. But then somehow there is some, dark phases, it's too much, maybe too much resistance. So um, the question is, somehow I think my ego thinks, I mean, I'm never without the course teachings. I'm with the foundations, uh, webinars. I daily open the book just randomly and it's, it's incredible. I'm, I'm in, I'm in connection with the Holy Spirit throughout the day. So I'm not really missing it, but I'm like, my ego is like, oh, well, you, you can't really um, do a good job if you don't do the lessons, you know. And, and also, I did feel the, the power it had when I did it. So my question is like, when I, and I, I feel it coming the past weeks, like I'm, I'm ready, actually, I want to, but now it's like, should I start at the beginning? <laughs> or should I kind of remember where I um, left off? Or I was even thinking, you know, just ask the Holy Spirit and open the book and ask him to where start. But I was just wondering if this is a question that came up in the past and what Ken would say or what you guys have to say who have been with this for decades. Yeah, I, that, that question did come up uh, a number of times. I, I heard Ken responding to students who would raise that question. And... <clears throat> And usually, usually he encouraged people just to, to keep going because don't go back to the beginning that that's usually the, the ego. And what it usually reflects is the ego saying, you got to get this right. Uh, and and that's, that is our ego again. It's saying, I've, I've got to do this right. Uh, Ken has often said that the, the most helpful thing is to realize that we're not going to live up to what it is that we're being asked to do in each of these lessons and to just forgive ourselves for it. That would be much, much more helpful. Uh, so in your case, as you say, there's some fear that comes up that maybe takes you away from, uh, from wanting to con continue, at least in that moment. But 
it seems it would seem reasonable to just resume where you had been and, and continue. And if there continues to be some fear, just ask for help in understanding, you know, what that what that fear is really all about. Because that those kinds of feelings when they come up are they're clearly the ego, and so those are obviously opportunities to take a look at at, at what's there. Uh, there may be certain words, certain concepts that are, that are being suggested in the lesson that it would be helpful to be able to, to recognize and just ask for, for help in beginning to, to move, move through whatever resistance is, is related to that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, Brooke next. Then we'll go to Ronald after that and then John. Thank you. Th and thank you all for like helping me heal over Ken Wapnick. I've been reading the course for a lot of years. And early on, I was listening to some of Ken's tapes and, and, and reading some of the stuff. And, and I reacted and I know it's my ego projecting my own authoritarianism, but that's what I would see in his attitude. And Jeff, you had just said, uh, you were quoting him several minutes ago, Ken, on uh, don't use the uh, workbook lessons for affirmations. And I've been doing that for a lot of years and they're helping me. And of course, Jesus says in it to, to like, it's kind of like reward any progress we're making. Not, yeah, anyway. And then I also got upset with Ken doing the battle over the copyright on the Course in Miracles. So maybe you can say some more and I appreciate Diane and, and you, Jeff, and, and John's been trying to help me with this too to ease my resistance to Ken. And I know there's something great there. That's why I wanted to be on and, and hear this discussion today. So anything more you can add on that, it's, you know, whether about the affirmation stuff or the copyright, or just uh, see, me seeing more of the compassionate, loving, and kind side of, of Ken. And I, I will get that kindness book. Okay, go. <laughs> Jeff, do you want well, to say sure. anything? In, in terms of the affirmations, uh, I mean, I, I used affirmations myself as part of my process, uh, most of it before the course, and I found them very helpful, you know, so I'm, it's, not, it's not that these things can't be of, of some help, but, but I think what Ken, Ken was trying to emphasize is that if that's all you see them as, you're missing what they really are there to help, help you with. And and it's not, it's not bad to use them as affirmations. I'm not, Ken certainly wasn't saying that, and that's, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but, it, but it is so much more, they are so much more than that. And that's what, uh, it, it can be after a while, what Ken was suggesting is that it can be a way in which we are avoiding going deeper with what the lesson is actually uh, asking us to recognize. I mean, there, there's a wonderful, titles of lessons like I want the peace of God <laughs> but when you start reading them uh, or uh, or light and joy and peace abide in me but when you start reading them there is such an uncovering of darkness there that that those lessons are really all about and so uh, about our resistance you know we, we can say those words but not mean them is what Jesus actually says at the beginning of uh, I want the peace of God and so that's really what Ken was talking about how we can latch on to a particular statement that we like to say, but you use it to avoid going any deeper. Uh, okay. and, I, I can see that. Yeah. And then right. the, Thank you. Thank just you. briefly on the copyright. Uh, in, in, in the end, I know Ken, Ken uh, it was, that was, that was what uh, seemed to need to be happening in the world at that time in terms of uh, challenges to the copyright. And uh, Ken, my sense of Ken was he was never really in, invested in an outcome with that. Uh, certainly in terms of how I saw him, you know, when, when, we, uh, when the copyright was lost. So uh, it was something, I mean, I, when I first heard about it, I thought, well, why, are we, why, are, why do they need to be fighting and doing all this, you know? But that wasn't, that clearly wasn't how Ken was looking at it. It was just, uh, I mean, he has said at times that uh, it can be kind to, to attempt to place limits on people who are abusing whatever that, you know, whatever their authority they may have. And so my sense was that, it, that he wasn't trying to control anything. He was just 
simply recognizing that there were some abuses going on. And he happened to be in a role at that point in time where th uh, this was, these were the steps that, that seemed like they needed to be taken. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Ronald and then to John Sunday. Hey, John. Hey, Jeff. Good to see you. Hey, uh, hey, you know, we know a lot about Helen's hearing and receiving ability. And I just was listening to one of Ken's workshops, and he was talking about Bill having a check of a certain amount ready for Louie when he came by without him even knowing or having asked him. So obviously, Bill was tuned in and had some kind of receptivity. Could you speak about Ken's and Bill's receptivity to hear Jesus or the Holy Spirit? We don't hear a whole lot about that. We kind of sense that they do, but perhaps could you speak a bit to that? I don't, in terms of Bill, I don't know really much more than you do in terms of both what, you know, what uh, Ken wrote about, about uh, Bill in, in absence from Felicity and then what Carol Howe wrote about uh, Bill in uh, Re Remember to Laugh. Uh, so I, I really couldn't add anything to that. As, as far as Ken, uh, he that's not something that he never really talked about. Uh, in particular, though, what I would say is what he wanted us to recognize that hearing, hearing Jesus or hearing the Holy Spirit, is it, it's not really about the form of what we hear. I mean, in Helen's case, she heard some very specific things and and certainly part of that whole process for her and Bill early on was getting specific uh, guidance about, uh, you know, where to stand for a taxi cab or, you know, where to find the particular clothing that she was looking for, shoes or pa green pantyhose, whatever it might have been. Uh, but but Ken never focused on that, never emphasized that. Uh, what What seemed clear was that he just recognized that there, if, if, if you get your own ego out of the way and recognize wherever the ego is involved and just are able to step back from that, whatever will come, whatever will come through you then will be uh, a reflection of, of that guidance. Uh, and it, you know, it may or may not be an answer to a, a question that you're aware that you're asking, but it's, uh, it's not the specific answers Ken said are, are never really what's important. Uh, when he talks about the song of prayer, he gets into that in, in quite, quite detail and qu in quite in depth in terms of we don't want, we don't want the, the specifics. We, we want the whole song. Yeah, the uh, conversations that I've had with Bill and Ken, um, both in person and over the phone, uh, they were obviously plugged in, tuned in, turned on. Um, to what degree I mean, it was like Helen, I don't know, but obviously in their own right, they were. And it seemed like they really did have one foot in this world and one in the next. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought perhaps you might uh, give your reflection of having known them much more closely. I, I didn't know Bill at all. Uh, when I went and I joined the uh, Jerry Jampolsky's uh, Center for Attitude and Healing in 1988, uh, in September, I went to, to volunteer there, and I was looking forward to meeting Bill. And when, and when I got there, I learned that he had he had actually uh, had died on July fourth, just a couple of months earlier. So I never actually met Bill. Um, Ken, I, I never talked. I mean, I never talked to him about that. Other staff might might have had some uh, conversations with him about that, but I uh, I didn't ever really speak to him about what what his experience was. I I, I just I, I trusted. Uh, both, both he and Gloria. Uh, whenever any decisions were being made, I I just trusted that that they knew better than any of the rest of us in terms of what would be what would be most helpful in decisions about how the uh, the foundation should function, what direction we should be going. And I certainly, whenever I asked Ken for or sh shared with him any of my, any of the challenges that I was experiencing in my life, it, whatever he had to share with me just always was was very helpful. And I never did ask him where it was coming from or how he was experiencing it. I just knew that I trusted him. I trusted him what, you know, whatever, whatever he might decide. Uh, that he's, uh, there was a quote I think he got from a, 
friend uh, that he's never been able to track, is never able to track down, but he said, uh, the quote essentially said, if a, if a wise man offers you poison, take it. If a foolish man offers you the antidote, refuse it. Wow. Ken, Ken was a wise man. <laughs> it's interesting uh, in seeing Gloria work with Ken, uh, there are really two peas in a pod that really seemed to enhance who Ken was. It was like a magnification. So it was, it was a phenomenal experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, John, well, do you have any feedback on Bill? Well, a little bit. Um, Bill had this kind of incredibly gentle presence. Um, I always felt like he was one of the first to really get the course, but I mean, to really absorb it and just sort of take it into his being and then kind of let the world be what it was. I mean, he wasn't out there writing books and things like that. One of the, one of the times I remember, Bill, I was at uh, Judy Whitson's apartment, I think it was. I was sitting on the couch with Helen. Helen was holding my hand, I think probably trying to help me deal with some problem I was dealing with at the time. And I looked up and Bill was standing there in this kind of cardigan, it was a cardigan sweater, and just smiling at the two of us. And I just thought that was just the most gentle presence. That's just the way that I, that my primary experience of Bill. And there he was, the presence. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, that was kind of my experience of Bill is, he was just Mr. Smiles. It's, yeah. He showed up. Yeah. Yeah. And he knew what was going on. And he was very, very incredibly bright. You know, so uh, he got it real quick. Let's go on to uh, Susan you. now. And, and then uh, John. Or no, I already said John. So we'll do John and then Susan. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here to take advantage of your. Cracker Jacks showing up today. So uh, I don't know if you remember Jimmy, Jeff, I was at your Roscoe a couple of times there. But um, my question is around, um, I, I, I asked Ken Wapnick one time about a, sort of a scenario and he looked at me and he says, what's that going to do with you, John? And, and uh, <laughs> you know, and I, f I feel now I'm back in the same scenario. And you, you just mentioned about those, um, uh, the wise man offering me you poison, you know. I didn't get what the fool what the fool was offering you the antidote, but anyway, I, I feel like right now that there's uh, there's there's uh, convicted felons who've harmed a lot of people, and now they're trying to give me they're trying to give me some poison, and I don't want to take it. And th these are the big pharma pharma people who who have who have already. Um, uh, being, being paid millions and millions of dollars as, as uh, you know, reparations, and now they're continuing, and I refuse to take it. And this is bothering me because uh, it's it kind of incites the same feelings and stuff that that I had when I spoke to Ken about quote the evil in the world that I perceive. And um, I'm, I'm just I'd like to take advantage of of of, you to, of your wisdom in what what you might offer me because I feel like I'm being drawn back into. A guilt attack and all this shit, you know. So basically, um, and I'm not happy with this, you know. And it's showing up in some. It, it, I didn't realize how how antagonistic I was to this thing, Jeff, uh, John. And so, if you could offer me any um, <laughs> anything, I'd appreciate it. I'd, I'd appreciate it. So that's my question. It's. The simplicity of the course is that it's <laughs> no matter what the problem is, the answer is always the same. And you're you're kind of already I could hear from what you're saying. You're recognizing what's what's going on here. But uh, whenever we find ourselves reacting to anything, anyone, you know, whether it's somebody immediately in our presence or something a little, little more abstract maybe as a, you know, a, an institution, a corporation, a multinational corporation, far, big pharma. Uh, it's the ego's defense is, is to make it complicated and to make it look like the issue really is whatever it is that, that they're doing to, to countless people, victimizing people in so many different ways and, and judging them for that. Uh, and as Ken would often say, you, you don't want to deny that this, in fact, is, is you know, what in so many cases really is, is going on at this level. 
Uh, so you don't you don't deny that. You don't deny that. That that's important. Uh, when we realize that the whole world was made, <laughs> and this is really something Kenneth says, it's it's really unique to the course's teachings. You don't you don't find it really anywhere else. Certainly not not explicitly the way Ken has made it clear. The course is telling us that the world was made to be a battleground. It was made to be in conflict. And so as long as we're identified with our ego, everything that we experience in, here in this world is going to have that conflict somewhere. Sometimes it's out in the open. Sometimes it's just beneath the surface. Uh, it even, you know, even in our special love relationships, when they're meeting our needs, everything's okay. But as soon as it doesn't go quite the way we want it, then the judgment comes up, but it was there all along. It was just covered over because we were getting what we wanted. So, so the point I'm wanting to make here that Kim was always emphasizing is that the world was made to be a place of conflict. And so it doesn't matter who I'm experiencing the conflict with. What I wanna be able to recognize is that, Ken said there were really only two workbook lessons that we really need. Uh, lesson five, I'm never upset for the reason that I think. And lesson 34, I could see peace instead of this. I can see peace instead of this. And so the I am never upset for the reason that I think. We start with that one because we always think we're upset because of the situation in the world. And the chat the Jesus challenge in the course is to help us to recognize no, the only reason I'm upset is because I've chosen my ego. Yeah to guide me as, as my teacher in how I'm looking at this. And what I, which means therefore I've made guilt real in my own mind and I need to do something with that guilt. And so I have to find somebody or something to put that guilt onto. And as long as I continue to see them as the problem, the guilt in my own mind is safe and the ego is home free. And so what we need to be able to recognize is, uh, and you were suggesting this too, that as long as I continue to hold on to these thoughts, it's myself that I'm punishing. It's not having any effect on anybody else. And maybe sometimes some of the things I do, if I speak out loud as somebody who's right there in my presence, I can get them into the much more into the conflict as well. But the point is what I'm really reinforcing is, is the guilt in my own mind and therefore the pain. And all of that's coming from this decision that I still want to see myself as separate from everyone else. And right. In the world we are, but as minds, as minds, and the mind, the mind that's behind the, the multinational corporations is the same mind that's behind my part of the dream. And we all share that one mind. Uh, but if I need to see you and use you as the enemy, what I'm doing, uh, I'm excluding you from the circle of atonement and I'm excluding myself from the circle of atonement. And so that's, it's, it's not that we shouldn't experience conflict. <laughs> we're here in the world and we're going to, but it's what are we gonna use it for? What, what are we going to do with it? Are we just going to reinforce the beliefs that they're, they are the problem? Or are we gonna recognize what the problem really is? And it's a problem that I really do have a choice about. Uh, thinking of the chart again, it comes back to the decision maker, the miracle, the projection, of the guilt takes me into the world and then I'm in, I'm doing battle, uh, at least in my mind, with those who I see are the evildoers. The miracle on the other side of the chart takes my attention back up to the mind, to the, to the choice point in the mind where I can recognize, oh, the reason I'm feeling this way is because I chose the ego, not because of anything that they're doing. And it's possible for no one else to change at all and I could be at peace. Right. And that's the real power of the course. But it's our choice. And there's no judgment coming from Ken or the course when we continue to choose the ego. But uh, because Jesus says he'll, you know, he'll wait till we're, till we're ready. Uh, he's not pushing us. Uh, and if, if there's any sense of pressure, it's our ego joining again in the process and saying, you should be doing better than this. What's your problem? This is the same problem you had all those years ago. And how it is again. Haven't you learned anything? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the ego's double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Alive and well. Yeah, yeah. But you want to smile at it just like that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate that uh, that uh, discourse. I really, really appreciate that. And, just to underline what Jeff was saying, that Jeff's answer was great, but a couple of lines from the course that I like. Let all things be exactly as they are. And another one is, uh, let him be who he is. Seek not to make a love an enemy. Uh, kind of bringing, keep coming back to those. And then realizing the insanity is insanity in my, my mind. It doesn't mean that things need to be, don't need to be fixed and improved in the world. I think as a matter of fact, things are being fixed and improved in the world because of a, an evolution that's going on. But the thing that's happening with Black Lives Matter, for example, is it's a growth out of that. It's, it's a long, dr drawn out process of awakening to the fact we have to treat everybody exactly as, as they are, or as our brothers and sisters. Uh, there's no difference between us here at all. And if I could just uh, piggyback on that one for the thing sure. too. And Ken, Ken always said, you know, that it, this doesn't mean that you don't do anything in the world. This is not a course in passivity, right. but it is a course in saying that if you are, if you get your own ego out of the way, whatever you do is going to be truly helpful, right. rather than continuing to create division and re reinforce the divi division. So it's not a fight. It's uh, yeah. Th there's a way of uh, loving our way through this. Yeah. Do whatever it is. Right. Right. Let's go to Suzanne. Susan. Uh, this point. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. So great teachings. You guys are both wonderful. I have been studying A Course in Miracles for over 30 years and I, I adore the book. Um, I guess, okay, my question is, oh, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. The only thing real is the love. Everything else is a hallucination. So at each moment, we're either extending our love or projecting our fear. But a reaction comes up. You know, we need to sit with it in order to get to the other side of it. Um, I always quote this Araya Mountain Dreamer poem. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without trying to hide it or fade it or fix it. Very next line is about dancing with joy. I want to know if you can dance with joy and allow the ecstasy to fill you from the tips of your fingers uh, to the bottom of your toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, to remember the limitations of being human. So the only way to get to the other side of that pain is to sit with it, but sometimes it's not that easy. It's much easier to project it and see the guilt in somebody else, but that doesn't work. It just exacerbates the feeling. You know, how would you describe to someone the pain is coming up? How do you sit with it? How do you take responsibility for it? Because once we take responsibility ability for it, it dissipates. But how do you do that? Very good question. Yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, it, the course talks a lot about trust, trusting the process and <laughs> And that, you know, when we first, certainly when people first come to the course, that the trust isn't, isn't there. And that's part of what we're learning as we, as we sense that gentle presence that is speaking to us through the words. Uh, so we, we trust in being, being able to sit with the pain. And we also want to remember that we're not alone in doing this. And that's, that's why the course emphasizes, and the, the workbook is certainly an important part of helping us get in touch with our inner teacher to recognize that we're not being asked to do this on our own. And in fact, we cannot do it on our own. So to remember that there is this loving, gentle presence that's there within all of our minds. It's on Ken's chart, it's represented by the, by the right mind, but it is there. It is something there that's always available to us. When we're not experiencing it, it's because we are resisting it, we are afraid of it. And that's really where the pain is coming from. So just to be able to recognize and acknowledge my own responsibility for what it is that I'm experiencing. And to recognize, I, as it talks about, Jesus talks about in rules for decision, I don't, you know, I don't like how I'm feeling. And so maybe there is, a, maybe there is another way of looking at this, uh, including my, my own pain. And so just trusting that there is an answer that's, that's there within me, but 
sometimes it can seem like it'll, it can take a long, long time. Uh, you know, whether it's sometimes people are experiencing physical pain, sometimes it's emotional pain, but it is possible. Kenneth said it's possible to still be continuing to experience the pain and to be at peace at the same time. And it will, it, it will fade in its intensity, maybe in terms of something that's physical, it may not even go away completely, or maybe th there will be moments when it does and then it's, then it's back again. But this, this it can be used for ego purposes or for right-minded purposes. And so, so the, the trust, the trust that, th that there is an answer there, a presence within me that will help me heal what it is that I continue to hold on to. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So we're at two o'clock. I don't know whether there are any other <clears throat> uh, folks that wanted to come on or not, but do I see any hands? Well, maybe we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, yes, yes, we'll, thank you. good to see you. Down the road, we'll do something like this again, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, really. thank you. It's good, good to see see all all of you and so many familiar faces. All right, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Oh, there's Diane Serrancioni. Let's let's uh, here, right? I did see that you had a comment before, Diane. Uh, what would you like to share? Hi, John. I just want to, I think on behalf of everybody, I want to share the appreciation for the two of you who I've known for decades. Um, and uh, John, your generosity of heart it just is so abundant. And Jeff, I know your true heart, having worked with you so many years here in Zipper. Yeah. Just two quick things, if I may offer, because, you know, I, I was here with Bill for years, uh, living in Tiburon and being, uh, knowing Jerry, of course, and then marrying and having 40 years together, Jerry Jampolski. Um, and Bill was, the thing I, as I recall of Bill so much was his incredible humor and how he mm. really, really didn't take it all so seriously. I remember asking him yeah. one time, I said, Bill, what about this female that like the he thing? I said, you know, I've spent my life going through Christian theology. I said, the he thing is really hard and um, the gender issue. And he said, well, just, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> just kind of change it around with your mind or, you know, Bill was always like, tear out the page. He just had a beautiful sense. And I remember the day before he died, I was back East. Jerry had dinner with him and he was stuck in traffic, bringing Bill from the airport for three hours. And right. Jerry, three hours with him. And then the next day when he passed, he took a little walk from Judy's, had said, well, I'm kind of done. I think I've cleared, I healed my relationships. He walked out on the street and he had his heart attack. And right next to him, I believe, as I recall, there was a cardiologist in this driveway just to make sure that this wasn't an accident. You know, he was leaving, which was really quite amazing. And, um, and but about Ken, I, I, I recall, of course, decades of he and Gloria in, in our lives and us in their lives. And I remember I knew Jerry just about a year and um, Ken was there and uh, in Tiburon. And all of a sudden, I found myself in Jerry's office, only with Ken sitting down. And I had never really met him before. I didn't know who he was. And um, he starts asking me questions. And I'm thinking, oh, this is like a little interrogation here. And it was so sweet because I thought to myself, oh, he must really love Jerry if he's asking me these questions. And one of the questions I remember, he said, what do you want from Jerry? And no oh. one ever I hadn't even thought about it. And I thought, and I said, actually, there's nothing I want from Jerry. Mm. I said, what I want in my life is, is peace. And I want to know my higher self while I'm still in my lower self. And I had the impression that Jerry would like to do the same. And he just went, hmm, okay. <laughs> and, 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 really really incredibly delightful um, oh. <laughs> I to share those two thoughts and, oh, thank you and Diane. You're, you're welcome my gratitude to you both jerry's transition this december was beautiful oh my god and he is here in spirit and yes there is no death the son of god you know is free the last time i saw you two you were dancing it was just that's that's my memory it's so <laughs> lovely <laughs> it's so to beautiful. on jerry's 90th birthday right yes yeah. yes 
<laughs> Love to you both. Thank you so much, the two of you. You are such a, such a blessing in this world. I send you all my love. And oh. Phoebe is a, Phoebe is on the call too. I know she's. I said. saw Phoebe. Yes, yes. So good to see you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I saw that she was. That's great. That's great. Uh, David, oh, Winner, you wanna share something? Yes. Thank you, John. And good to see you again, Jeff. I was on the call a month or two ago. I noticed in the introduction that you were. Uh, worked with Jerry yes, sir. Uh, before you worked with Ken. I've been reading Jerry's first book. I just came across it a few months ago and finding it extremely helpful. Uh, I know this is mainly about Ken, but if appropriate, are there any comments you would make about Jerry? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Jerry's that such a, a dear, dear man. I mean, I, I feel blessed that I had those four years to, to be with him. He was uh, just one of the kindest people. Uh, I, and, and, and also just so honest too. I, I mean, so honest about what he was aware of might still be his, his limitations. And uh, it was just to have the opportunity to be there with him for, for four years. It was, a, it was an important, being at the, the center was an important stepping stone for me from, I've been at the University of Miami on the faculty there. And I was considering getting involved in uh, uh, becoming a therapist, a trained as, like, as a psychologist, but a research psychologist. And it was all just things that I clearly was not in control of in terms of how I ended up getting connected with Jerry because I was working with a uh, program with children with AIDS in Miami and he had heard about it through somebody who lived both in San Francisco and in Miami. And, and so I just got a phone call from Jerry one day out, out of the blue asking me about my work with children with pediatric AIDS since he had been concerned so so much with the center with children with life-threatening illnesses. So uh, that that was the beginning of our connection. And I, to, to my friend who shared the uh, things of Kenzie shared also books of, of Jerry's. And so it just, it just unfolded. I mean, that, at that point in my life, everything just happened in a way that I just tried to pay attention because the, the next steps were, were so obvious if I just kept myself out of the way. And one of those steps clearly was to go and, and join Jerry at, at the center. I mean, I was able to meet him uh, before, about many months before I ended up taking a leave of absence from the university and going and volunteering at the, at the center. And it, it, was, it was just, I mean, the opportunity that that provided me on, on my path to, to get to work in that center, to, to get the opportunity to, to be in support groups, to help facilitate support groups, all of the things that the Jerry's vision had made possible uh, was just, just such a, a golden opportunity for me. It became apparent at, through the four years there then and the opportunity then to go to the, the foundation in New York that, that that was really then where my path was leading me to, to the foundation. But but that opportunity to be at, at the center. Uh, it, was, it was something too, in terms of the University of Miami, I could explain to them when I was taking my leave of absence that I was going to a place uh, where uh, they were doing support groups for children with life-threatening illnesses and all. And they were very open to that and giving me the leave of absence. If I had told them that I was going to the foundation and what that was all about, it, it, it might not have uh, got over so well. <laughs> But, uh, but it was for me personally, it was something I really, really needed, needed to do and found just very, very helpful on, on my path. And Jerry was just, was just a pivotal central part of that. So, so important in, in those early, early steps with the course for me. Well, unless there's any other questions, um, thank you, Jeff. It's wonderful having you here. I love your clarity and your deep understanding of the teacher of teachers for us. And I, I do, we, we will come back and do this uh, somewhere down the road. Yes, I'm, thank you for the opportunity. This has been, this has been my initiation, my, my baptism mm -hmm. to, to Zoom programs. So <laughs> now, I, now I know how wonderful it could be. <laughs> thank yeah. you to everyone. It's, it's been beautiful to be able to be here with everybody. Into his presence would I enter now. Into his presence would I enter now. Into
to it.